and it is good to be back. I mean, after doing nothing but Fates videos for the last couple of months, it feels great to do a video about something that isn't Fire Emblem related. And what better way to kick this off than by doing a Monster Hunter video. Now, I've already talked about the monsters in Monster Hunter, both best and worst. However, there's another species of monster I have yet to discuss, as well as being one of the most interesting aspects of the series, the subspecies. Subspecies are a variation of an already established monster, often making them stronger and more dangerous by changing up their fighting style or giving them new elemental properties, while still staying true to the essence of the original monster. Now, subspecies to me are often very hit or miss depending on how they're done, and originally I planned to do a top 5 best and worst subspecies list. However, when looking through all the subspecies throughout the series, there are a lot of subspecies I really liked and I couldn't just narrow it down to 5, so it seems this list just got upgraded to a top 10 list. But which of the 10 subspecies monsters were good enough to make it on this list? Well, that's why we're here today. So join me everyone, as it's time to sharpen your blade once again, as I count down my top 10 favourite Monster Hunter subspecies. Before we begin, there are a few things I need to clear up. First of all, this is just my opinion, and I'm ranking these monsters on how much I like them and how good of a subspecies I find them to be. On that note, my second point is that when ranking subspecies, I tend to look for how the subspecies in question can bring something new to the table instead of just being a recolored version of the monster, whether it be a new type of fighting style or new elemental type. Thirdly, is that I'm only looking at one subspecies per monster since some monsters have multiple subspecies. And finally, I'm not looking at the variant monsters from Generations because that's going to be its own list at some point, along with top 10 worst subspecies. And with all that cleared up, what say we suit up and get ready for battle? It's been a long time, but now we must head back to Monster Hunter and we've got a brand new set of monsters to tackle head on. Let's just hope that this time, I don't pronounce the names wrong. Pink Raytheon. Looks can most certainly be deceiving, since something that looks girly and soft could actually be dark and disturbing. I mean, I went into Madoka Magica thinking it'd be a cute and fun anime, and now I'm scarred from my life and contemplating my very existence. With this in mind, you'd think that the Pink Raytheon isn't the least bit dangerous or threatening because, well, it's pink. Well, it turns out the Pink Raytheon is a literal monster, since this version of the Raytheon is packing some serious power and is deadly if you take it for granted. I'll admit, the Pink Raytheon isn't that much different from the normal Raytheon, all things considered, but she is much harder to fight and can be quite challenging, but in a good way, even for someone like me who knows the Raytheon like I know Fire Emblem. <laughs> what do you mean Libra's a dude? Well, fuck, I've been lied to all my life. The Pink Raytheon is one of two Raytheon subspecies and was first introduced in Monster Hunter G. Now, the Pink Raytheon, as far as subspecies go, isn't much different from the normal Raytheon. In fact, it's almost identical aside from some differences in behaviour, in the sense that it's much more aggressive. With that said, her change in behaviour does make quite the difference, since the Pink Raytheon is a rather challenging monster, even if you studied the Raytheon's fighting style. Now, the reason the Pink Raytheon is much harder is that for one thing, her base damage is a lot higher and she's faster as well, so even her standard attacks pack quite the punch. Not helping the man is that the Pink Raytheon knows this and actively uses her strongest attacks very often. I mean, every time I fight this thing, it loves to do the spinning tail whip attack, much to my dismay. So often this baby can take a huge chunk out of your health or outright one shot you if you're not careful. Adding to this is that the Pink Raytheon is more heavily armoured and bulky than before and I find that all these attributes help to make the Pink Raytheon a much more fun and thrilling monster to fight, since now the Raytheon presents a real challenge and you feel a real sense of accomplishment when taking this thing down. While one of the less original subspecies, I still find the Pink Raytheon to be one of the strongest subspecies from just the challenge factor alone and it goes to show that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover because this particular book will rip you to pieces and eat you alive. Talk about a severe paper cut. Shrouded Nursler. It seems that Nursler is moving up in the world. I mean, the normal version came 10th place on my best monsters list, and now the subspecies comes in 9th place for best subspecies. Heat this up and one day you'll make it to the top of a Monster Hunter video. Just pray it's for the right reasons. Indeed, coming in at number 9 is the Shrouded Nursler which is a case of, again, not being too much different from the original version, but having some really neat new attributes and attacks to it, as well as having a more unique and unpredictable fighting style, making this one of the trickier monsters to fight, but also one of the more thrilling ones. The Shrouded Nursler is the only subspecies of Nursler and first appears in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. What's interesting to note about this version is that it feeds on Kezus instead of Gypsaurus this time around. It seems the Nursler likes to feed on everyone's most hated monsters. In that case, hurry up and feed off the Plesioth and all will be right with the world. This change in diet isn't just for show though, since not only does this change the Nursler's weakness from thunder to ice, but it also changes its status ailments from sleep to paralysis. 
Because of these changes, the Nuzzler's fighting style has adapted to take advantage of this, as now the Nuzzler will swing around like Spider-Man in order to paralyze you and take you down afterwards. As such, this version of the Nuzzler is rather tricky to fight due to his more erratic behavior, but aside from that, there isn't that much different to this monster. However, like with the Pink Raytheon, the challenge in taking this thing down feels much more rewarding, unless you don't like the Nuzzler to begin with, in which case, whew, good luck to you, buddy. While not that original, I really like the Shroud of Nuzzler for all that it does different, and how the changes, while very few, make finding this monster a much more thrilling experience, which is saying something because when I first faced the Nuzzler, my heart was racing at a mile a minute, and I'm still suffering from the side effects. <laughs> Baleful Giginox. Now this is weird. I mean, the subspecies of my least favorite monster somehow made it onto a best monsters list. This makes about as much sense as putting Astrid on a worst Fire Emblem units video just based on her performance in Radiant Dawn. Oh that? That never happened. Get the fuck out of here! I know this may seem strange since the Giginox is still my least favorite monster in the series, but honest to god, I enjoyed fighting the Baleful Giginox. I mean, it's not too different from the original in terms of fighting style, but I like the new elemental type that this version uses, and I don't know why, but I just have a fun time fighting this version. I guess there are some things you simply cannot explain, like why for some reason I can't stand Infernape. Yes, I know he's one of the best start Pokemon, but I just can't stand this thing. The Baleful Giginox is the only subspecies of Giginox, thank god, and was first introduced in Monster Hunter Portable 3rd. The major difference between this Giginox and the regular one is its elemental type, in this case Thunder and Paralysis, instead of Poison. While its attacks are the same, the different elements make the attacks more powerful and on occasion can stun you, allowing the Giginox to land an additional attack on you. On top of that, the Baleful Giginox is a lot more aggressive than the normal one, and focuses more on offense on top of everything else. With this in mind, the Baleful Giginox can be considered much harder than the normal Giginox, so why on earth do I even like this thing to begin with? Well, while it's more aggressive, it also leaves itself more open to a beating when it's using its stronger attacks, and therefore it's more exciting to fight. Plus, I find this version to be much less frustrating to fight, since you don't have to worry about being poisoned and having your health sapped away at you. Thank God! As some species go, it's not that much different in terms of fighting style, though the new elemental type really does make a difference with this thing, more so than you imagine. I honestly thought nothing good could come out of the Geeky Nox. I mean, those scars it left me run deep. But lo and behold, the subspecies proved me wrong since I find the Baleful Giganos to be an overall better monster in just about every way. Though that wasn't very difficult to do. Sand Barrioth. The Sand Barrioth is an interesting case, since I don't like this monster as much as the normal Barrioth when it comes to, well, just about everything. So you'd think this monster wouldn't even be considered for this list. Well, not exactly, since despite being a subspecies, this monster is still a Barrioth at its core, which is an automatic plus. And the fact that this monster's fighting style is really unique makes the Sand Barrack one of the strongest subspecies, even if it's weaker than the original. Huh, a different version of an existing product that was weaker than the original, but still strong in its own right. I've never heard that one before. The Sand Barrack is the only subspecies of Barrioff, and it first appeared in Monster Hunter Portable 3rd. As you can no doubt tell, the Sand Barrioff is a sand or desert based monster, and as such, it has lost its ice type properties for better and for worse. For one thing, it has lost its weakness to fire, but has gained a weakness to ice, over the irony. And from what I can tell, the Sand Barrioth is less aggressive than the original, since it tends to focus on using projectile attacks, which based on the attacks of the original Barrioth, may seem like a bad idea. However, there's a legitimate reason for why the Sand Barrioth acts this way. The biggest difference between the normal and Sand Barrioth is that it can make sand tornadoes that vary in size and can move about the battlefield. Not only that, but the Sand Barrioth can pull into its inner Sonic the Hedgehog and ride the tornado in order to propel itself at you at full force. And when that happens, you'd better prepare Uranus, because this thing is going in deep. Based on my experience with this thing, I noticed that the Sand Barrioth will wait it out and not be aggressive towards you. However, there will be times where it snaps and throws everything at you, and because of the tornadoes and such, a lot of the time you won't be ready for this thing, so you always have to be on your toes and never get too carried away when fighting this thing. As subspecies go, it's kind of in the middle since it does change up its fighting style and elemental type just enough to be considered a unique monster. However, I still find the normal Barrioth to be better overall, since it's a more exciting and to be honest challenging monster to fight, but even still I can appreciate this monster for what it does and even though the original is better, the Sand Barrow can still stand on its own two feet, provided I haven't broken its wings yet, because that's the first thing I do when I fight these things, it really cripples them in the long run. <laughs> Molten Tigrex What's this? The Tigrex has made it onto a best Monster Hunter video? Man, what I joked about in Fate's personal skills actually came true, guess that means the Keju is going to be in the next Monster Hunter video, huh? 
Yes, coming in at number 6 we have the Molten Tigrex, a monster I thought I was going to hate at first because, you know, it's the Tigrex. But I actually ended up really liking this thing, and thought it was a much better subspecies compared to the Brute Tigrex. Just goes to show that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Unless it's Shadow the Hedgehog, because let's be real here people, we all knew that game was going to suck. And suck it did. The Molten Tigrex is one of two Tigrex subspecies, and first appears in Monster Hunter 4. Now the Molten Tigrex, like the Baleful Giginox, is a monster I should hate with a burning passion, since it's still the Tigrex at the end of the day, along with being much bigger and having explosive properties, allowing it to deal a lot of damage and have even bigger attack range, which can become annoying from time to time. With that said though, this version of the Tigrex I find to be more stimulating to fight and surprisingly not nearly as frustrating or downright infuriating to fight as the other two Tigrexes. Who'd have thought, right? The main reason for this is to do with its behaviour, since the normal Molten Tigrex is rather tame when fighting it, since it doesn't attack you as much as the other two and is rather slow moving to begin with. However, when it gets angry, then shit gets real since it becomes much faster and aggressive and uses a lot more explosive attacks that can be deadly most of the time. As such, you need to balance offense and defense when fighting this thing because of how it behaves, very similar to how you would fight the Diablos. Not to mention its bigger size can be a double-edged sword, since it's easier to land hits on, but also harder to avoid. I feel these attributes make the Molten Tigrex a strong subspecies since while the explosive element isn't much to write home about, unless it just so happens to take out half your health bar, I honestly feel the way this Tigrex behaves not only makes fighting it a different experience compared to the normal Tigrex, but it's an overall better experience since while it can still be just as, if not even more ferocious at certain points, it's not constantly in the state of mind all the time, so it's an overall more balanced monster, as well as being the sixth best subspecies in the Monster Hunter series. <laughs> Ivory Lagaikris. Now this is certainly ironic. Coming in fifth place for both the best monster and best subspecies, I'm starting to notice a pattern here Lagaikris, so be warned because I'm watching you. Well, back to the topic at hand, at number 5 we have the Ivory Ligacris. Now I chose the Ivory Ligacris over the Abyssal one, since I found the fight to be more engaging with the Ivory Ligacris, and while the Abyssal version has more unique attacks, the Ivory version I find to be an overall harder fight, despite the Ligacris having a disadvantage of not being able to swim in this form, making this monster one of the most challenging and memorable monsters I've ever fought in the series, as well as being the monster that holds the record for the biggest beatdown ever. I don't have the footage to show what happened, but if a certain someone is watching this video, and I'm sure you are, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The Ivory Ligarichus is one of two Ligarichus subspecies, and first appears in Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. Now unlike the other two Ligarichus species, this one spends its time on land, which by that logic should make fighting this thing much easier, since most if not all water-based monsters in Monster Hunter 3 were harder to fight in the water. While that's not exactly the case since the Ivory Ligarichus is hard. Now in terms of fighting style, this thing really isn't that much different from the normal Lagaricris. The only difference is that this version tends to focus more on using lightning attacks. Now I bet you're thinking, so it uses more lightning attacks, big deal. They're easy to dodge and they don't do much damage, this thing should not be difficult. Well think again, because this baby is packing some serious firepower, since his lightning attacks got a massive boost. Now not only do they deal a lot more damage, but they have a very wide areas of effect to boot. So best not to get too close to this thing, or just like Shulk, you're really going to be feeling it, but not in a good way. This is what I find to be interesting about the Ivory Ligacris and why I find it to be such a good subspecies. This whilst less agile, can't use some of its best attacks and is at an overall disadvantage, the sheer brutality of its attacks can take a lot out of you, and you have to know when to attack and when to either pull back or take a defensive stance. So even though this Ligacris has less options than the other two, what it can do, it does very well, and results in being one of my favourite subspecies, as well as a monster you should never take lightly, Otherwise, you'll be taking a lightning blast where the sun don't shine, and considering the size of this thing's attacks, it will find its way there, and you will really be feeling it. Desert Celtus Queen Often subspecies in Monster Hunter will have different behavioural patterns compared to the original version, which is understandable. With the Desert Celtus Queen though, she takes this to a whole new level, since she often flip-flops between being very slow and otherwise pathetically easy, to a bloodthirsty beast that leaves nothing but destruction in its wake. So as you can see, the Desert Steltus Queen is a rather extreme monster, and the fight with it is just as extreme, often forcing you to adapt to the Queen's radical behaviour, making this one of the more intense and thrilling fights in the game. So be sure to be alert and ready at all times, or else you're going to regret it in the morning. The Desert Celtus Queen is the only subspecies of Celtus Queen and first appears in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. I think the best way to describe this thing is that she is very much like the Molten Tigrex, at least from my experience since this version of the Celtus Queen drastically changes her behaviour during the fight. At first the Desert Celtus is rather slow and laid back, 
focusing more on turtling in and using her tail and projectile attacks to fend you off. Once she gets pissed though, everything about her changes since she actively goes out of her way to hunt you down and uses a lot more aggressive attacks, as well as getting up close and personal with you. Sometimes a little too close. I need an adult! I need an adult! The Desert Celta screen doesn't have too many new attacks, but she's a lot more proficient with her tail, as well as, of course, using a normal Celtus to assist her in a fight. Like with the regular Celtus Queen, the addition of the Desert Celtus makes a big difference when fighting this thing, since not only are both of them much stronger than the originals, but the Desert Celtus can attack with paralysis attacks, which will happen a lot, and it allows the Queen to use her signature move, Celtus Blast, where she shoots the regular Celtus at you like a missile. This move is deadly since it can take a serious chunk out of your health, and while there's a long charge up time, the speed in which this thing travels is so fast that it causes the Celtus to shatter into pieces when it collides with a wall. And don't think for a second that this attack is a one and done thing, because the Desert Celtus Queen can dig up more Celtus like they were Master Emerald pieces and use this attack as much as she likes. It's actually kind of morbid now that I think about it. With all these attributes at the helm, the Desert Celtus Queen is a monster you really have to adapt to and be more cautious around when fighting making this fight a lot more thought provoking and engaging than the regular Celtus, which was already a pretty cool fight to begin with, along with having enough differences to make this a standout subspecies. Tiger Strike Xamtrios You know how I said subspecies monsters will have different behavioural patterns compared to their originals? Well the Tiger Strike Xamtrios is one of the best examples I can give, since it acts completely different to the regular Xamtrios and is definitely one of the more original subspecies when it comes to fighting style. While personally I prefer the normal Xamtrios, I really appreciate all that the Tiger Stripe version has going for it, along with this monster being pretty good overall. Even if this thing can be a bit annoying at times, Christ will you stop bouncing around like a space hopper for 5 seconds! The Tiger Stripe Xamtrios is the only subspecies of Xamtrios that first appears in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. In terms of abilities, the Tiger Stripe Xamtrios cannot use ice attacks or create ice armor like the original, which makes this version overall frailer and less sturdy. However, to make up for this, the Tiger Stripe Zamitra still retains its water attacks along with additional paralysis elements, plus this version is much faster and more aggressive, since its attacks come out faster and more ferocious, along with it having much less cooldown between moves. The real deal breaker for this monster, however, is how it uses inflation attacks. No longer is Zamitra's inflation simply a way to boost its bulk and prolong the fight, as well as make it a sitting duck most of the time, since now it uses that extra bulk to much better effect as it bounces around the battlefield like a space hopper trying to crush you, and considering the speed of this thing and how large the hitbox is, dodging this thing is easier said than done. As well as ironic that something so fat can move so fast, but then again after seeing Rufus in Street Fighter 4, nothing makes sense anymore. It's pretty obvious by now that the Tiger Strike Xamtrios is the exact opposite of the regular Xamtrios, training defense and ranged attacks for pure speed and power, so you must go into this fight prepared to run away and play defensively when need be, making this fight much more fast paced and intense. I will admit, sometimes this thing can get annoying with just how much it bounces around, I do prefer the normal Xamtrios overall, but even I have to admit that this is one of the strongest subspecies in the Monster Hunter series, offering up enough variety and differences to make this monster unique and original, while still keeping true to the core essence of the Xamtrios. I'm starting to think that the Xamtrios was one of the best monsters for Ultimate introduced, and that's saying a lot, believe me. Glacial like Nacta well, of course, the subspecies of Agnacta was going to be ice based. I mean, the whole fire and ice polar opposite thing has been done to death, even Pokemon is starting to use it with things like Alola and Ninetales. Not that, that this is a bad thing, though, since the Glacial Agnacta is certainly one of the coolest, pardon the pun, subspecies ever made, as well as being a really good contrast to the original Agnacta in many ways. Out of the two, I like them both equally, but since the Agnacta didn't make it onto the best monsters list, it only seems fair that the subspecies find a spot on this list. Just goes to show how effective the whole fire and ice concept can be. Man, now this has got me thinking about how cool a fire version of Esdef would be. And now I'm starting to get ideas. Nina, I'm gonna need your help. Fanventure.net, away! The Glacier Agnacta is the only subspecies of Agnacta and was first introduced in Monster Hunter Portable 3rd. From the get-go, you can tell this subspecies is playing the whole reverse card since it's ice-based. However, it runs further than simply cosmetic and elemental changes, since many of the attributes of the original have reversed effects, as well as this one taking a more defensive fighting style compared to the original's more offensive style. Good lord, there's so much 180 here, it's making the inverted cast and symphony of the night seem like a 5 degree angle in comparison. It's a math joke, people. Pretty much everything about the Glacier Nacta is a complete contrast to the regular one, since its armor begins out extremely tough but weakens over time, this version uses ice instead of fire attacks, this version fights more defensively and stays on the ground more often, you get the idea. With this in mind, you have to take a different approach when fighting this thing and use a different strategy than you would with the regular Agnacta, 
which I feel really helps to make this one of the more standout subspecies, since it really does feel like you're fighting a completely different monster, which is something I can't say for certain other subspecies. Pretty much everything I love about the Red Lagnato is present with the Glacial one, but the variations, both major and minor, help to make fighting this thing a fresh experience, as well as teaching you the importance of using different weapons and trying new strategies against each monster. The whole Fire and Ice concept has been done to death, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. I mean, just look at what Sonic is doing with it now. But while not very original, Monster Hunter uses this concept very well with the Glacial Agnacta, creating a subspecies that is a striking contrast to the original for all the right reasons, and landing it as the second best subspecies in the Monster Hunter series. Before we get to number one, I just want to do a few honourable mentions. First up is the Azura Ralphalos. I love the Azura Ralphalos since it's a much more challenging fight with its harder armour plating and overall stronger defence, not to mention having my favourite armour set in the game, but it really isn't that much different from the original Ralphalos. Next up is the Berserk Tetsukabra. I found this monster to be really cool with how it uses exploding boulders to attack you, but outside of that it was pretty much the same as the original. Not that that's a bad thing though. And finally there's the Jade Baroth. The Jade Baroth was certainly more aggressive than the original and was really well designed in terms of visuals and aesthetics, but the monster is very much the same as the original one, as well as being slightly easier ironically. Anyway with that out of the way, on to the number one entry. Stygian Zenoga. This monster is without question the best, and I mean best, subspecies in the entire Monster Hunter series. If any monsters are watching this video, and if they are, I have several questions as to how and why. This is how a subspecies is done. The Stygian Zenoga embodies everything that makes a subspecies monster great and amplifies it to the nth degree, since this monster is unique, has a new elemental type and fighting style, has one of my favourite armour sets in the series and is one of the coolest looking monsters ever created. And yet despite all this, it still remains true to the core essence of the Zenoga, making it both different yet familiar at the same time, which captures the point of the subspecies better than any other monster. It's just a shame certain other monsters didn't follow your example, Zenoga. The Stygian Zenoga is one of the Zenoga subspecies and first appears in Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. The Stygian Zenoga is such a varied and original monster despite being a subspecies, since it's got so many different and unique attributes to really make this monster stand out. I mean, aside from looking like the most badass and life-threatening monster that emerged from hell itself, this version of the Zenoga has the dragon element, as well as a lot of variations to its attacks and its behavioural patterns, that fighting this thing is not the same as fighting the regular Zenoga. And let me tell you from first-hand experience, if you go in with the mindset that fighting this Zenoga isn't any different from fighting the regular Zenoga, you are going to die. For one thing, because of its dragon element, this thing can inflict dragon blind, which is bad news for anyone who likes to use elemental weapons, made worse by the fact that the Stygian Zenoga can shoot dragon balls, yeah yeah yeah, seven magic dragon balls, ha bloody ha, that home in on you and can be difficult to dodge if you're not fast on your feet. Adding to this is that the Stygian Zenoga, from my experience at least, has a more calculated and strategic fighting style compared to the original's more aggressive and unpredictable style, since normally this thing will do one attack and then wait to use the next one. However, when the spikes erupt, it will do two attacks in a row, and when it is enraged, it uses three attacks in a row. And because of this, you have to be just as calculated with your attacks, since if you try to rush this thing down while it's attacking, you might as well just give up and dig yourself an early grave. Because of all these factors, the Stygian Zenoga is such a great monster to fight by itself, and is even better as a subspecies. Not to mention that this thing has the coolest armour in the entire series, and its weapons are just as awesome. And there you have it. The Stygian Zenoga is my favourite subspecies in the Monster Hunter series being a downright badass and awesome monster on its own, but having so many differences and attributes that make this monster unique, and show exactly how a subspecies should be done when it comes to Monster Hunter. And to be honest, you can't get much better than that, which is why the Stygian Zenoga takes the number one spot as my favourite subspecies from the Monster Hunter series. This has been Blazing Night. I wish you all a great night, take care, and the subspecies in Monster Hunter are easily some of the best parts of the game, as they really do add more meat to the monsters and make fighting the same monster a new and exciting experience. Well, most of the time, since there are certain subspecies which are just plain terrible, and I have a lot to say about them. But that's another list for another time, since it's time for me to move away from video games. As for the next video, it's anime time once again. Hey everyone, thank you for watching today's video. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, and why not subscribe to my channel in order to keep up to date with when the new videos are coming out. For alternate video recommendations, I first point you to my last video, Free Fall Episode 7, where both Heeman Gaming Station and I pit Fire Emblem Awakening against Fire Emblem Fates. Next up, I point you to Top 10 Monster Hunter Monsters, where I look at my top 10 favourite monsters from the Monster Hunter series, and for something completely different, why not check out my top 10 Zelda bosses, 
where I look at my 10 favourite bosses from the Legend of Zelda series. Hopefully one of those videos will be to your liking. Once again I thank you all for watching and I want to say a big thank you to all of you who follow me on Amino. I love all the positive feedback you give me and the art you send my way. You people are so awesome and I love you very much. But before I go, I'm handing it over to this guy. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Blazy Knight. Hey interwebs, Joey Pals here, and if you don't know me, well, you will soon enough. Do you guys like Amazon and Pokemon? Like, a lot. Enough to get a 6-foot Pikachu or a life-size Camilla plushie, no matter the price? If so, I have a game just for you. On the forums for Pokemon Online, I will be launching a game called Big Brother on November 15th. If you've seen the TV show Big Brother, it'll work very similarly, and if you haven't, simply Google it. The main plus is that there's no physical component involved, so if you want, you can play in your underwear. Signups for my forum game will last from November 15th through November 22nd. Don't think you're just walking away with nothing though, as there's plenty of money to be won. The amount of money you can win is based on the amount of people that join. So let's just say for example 80 people join. First place in an 80 person setup would receive $100, second place would get 50, and third place would get 25, with each jury member besides third place receiving $10. Not only that, but for each challenge you win, you would receive an additional $5. So let's just say one of the maximum amount of challenges you can win in an 80 person setup and win the whole game on top of it. You could win a massive $220 on Amazon. How crazy is that? It's a very nice opportunity to not only make some money, but also make some new friends and connect with a fanbase here. Interested? Well, unfortunately the game isn't live as of Blazing Knight posting this video, but as soon as the game is live, I will share with him a link for signups to share with you guys. Thank you so much for listening everyone, and who knows, I just might be back.